The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwm.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Seeing the stars as beautiful as they are in the Milky Way with your naked eye and then being able to photograph it, it's just, it's mind blowing and it's addicting. We uncovered a track here that hasn't seen the light of day for 112 million years. Maybe they don't want to really take up fishing as a family sport forever, but they want to attend a fun event like this. Pants are breathable. Ebree, that's all folks. outside for 30 years. The universe is amazing, the sky is amazing, and seeing the stars as beautiful as they are in the Milky Way with your naked eye and then being able to photograph it, it's just, it's mind blowing and it's addicting. You can't see anything like this in most parts of the state, most parts of the country. I would much rather be in a, in a park somewhere in the mountains or hiking or exploring than sitting in traffic. We're out here because it is one of the, if not the darkest sky in the lower continental 48 with a workshop group who have all signed up to come out here and learn how to photograph the night sky. I come out a day early. I come out and scout out locations to make sure that you know, I know where the Milky Way is going to be rising, so I can get them a good shot. And not run over this little road runner here. If we were here and there's you know a giant light right here, obviously that's not going to work for our shot. But it looks like it's going to work out pretty nicely because you know it's no light here. Terling was back here. That'll be minimal light. Really kind of stoked about this one, and I haven't shot it yet, so it'll be really fun. That's always my biggest fear is to come back and like Terling was all of a sudden like blown up <laughs> and you have like this huge city. Some of these students are brand making new into photography and you know they're just now learning how to turn on their camera. Some have gone from the film days and now they come to digital and they want to learn how to shoot digitally. You know my goal for you guys is not only to learn but to walk away with at least one shot from this trip that you're like I want to go and print this and hang this up my wall. And if you get that one shot, that's a good weekend. You know, I've been on trips for a week where I've gone out. Sunset approaches, I take them out to our first area to shoot at. Introduce them to their subjects, show them ideas for compositions, show them, you know, where the Milky Way and the stars will be. Um, the lower the better, Milky Way comes up right here. It's a really, really nice composition. And then as we go from, you know, sunset to twilight, they start getting a few hints of the stars above and then about a half hour after sunset, they get a full blown view of the Milky Way. And uh, we spend the next five, six hours out here shooting. It's really cool bringing students out here because many of them don't get to see the stars like this. They're stuck in cities, which, you know, they see three or four stars and they think, you know, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And when they come out here, their minds are absolutely blown because they can just see the night sky as beautiful as it is. And once they get shooting, all I ask is no red lights, no cell phones, no lights at all. That's going to make the whole process go much faster. And I teach them how to light paint their subjects, how to expose for the Milky Way, how to focus on it, and really how to take something that 
is absolutely majestic in the sky and tell a story with it. That bush is that the light's on. Really? Yep. So you're going to cover basically almost 180 degrees. Okay. You could simply walk outside, take a picture of the Milky Way in the sky, but I try to you know, figure out a way to tie that in with you know, a human interest. It's cool to incorporate it something as simple as you know, a cactus or a, a person or a building or uh, an old abandoned car. You know, telling a story of, okay, here's this town that's, you know, 100, 200 years old. You have a, a city that has come and gone, but yet it still has the same night sky as it did when it was booming. It's luck as well as skill and patience and practice and experience. It's moments like that that make you work for the shot, that make that final shot when you do get that beautiful Milky Way so, so worth every ounce of effort that you put forth. They've been extinct for millions of years, but thanks to human imagination and a bit of exploitation from pop culture, dinosaurs have made a comeback. They're, uh, they're flocking this way. Most writers and filmmakers will admit their reimagination of dinosaurs isn't especially true to life. And that brings us to our real-life cast of characters in their own real-life adventure. He's ready. Okay. Mark North, 66.84. Mike O'Brien is a graphics designer with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. As long as you're getting material out of there, yeah, keep scraping it. You need to start getting your gear together and... Dr. James Farlow is a professor of paleontology from Indiana. With a grant from the National Geographic Society, he's brought 21 students and volunteers nearly a thousand miles to sweep, swab, and swelter under the hot summer sun. We're gonna have a great opportunity today to get these recorded in 3D. It's so clear. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it gorgeous? That's awesome. That's just a beautiful shot up there. Oh, yeah. Isn't that cool? Very. That's the payoff for all this work we go through. Ready? If I can get this done and see it out there, a bunch of Google Earth files that people can interact with and plan their trip out here and, you know, know where things are. Did it skip a track yeah, I think he's heading that way. Uh, the one immediately by Mike's left hand looks like it's a right. Five, five, four, nine. Each number you hear will become a GPS coordinate that corresponds to a specific dinosaur track. Okay, ready? North, 76.267. The process can be excruciatingly slow, taking hours and sometimes days, depending on how many tracks are being mapped. Sometimes I get bogged down in the mechanics and the details and the drudgery of some of what has to be done to document them. But every once in a while, you sit back and reflect and, and you get that sense of wonder about what it is you are actually seeing when you see footprints made one after another by living dinosaurs. That's as close to seeing a living dinosaur going about its activities as you're going to get. And so that can't help but fire the imagination. After the GPS coordinates are recorded, Mike O'Brien takes a photo of each individual dinosaur track. That's one thing about this, this is not easy. Seems like everything is, is a challenge. And when the photographs, GPS coordinates, and Google Earth files are all combined, the result is this. I've got hundreds of, of photographs I bring all those back here and I'm able to stitch all those photographs together and we got some great photo mosaics of it. 
The blue tracks are a small sauropod. These red tracks are a pretty big acrocanthosaur, and you can see this green line and how all of a sudden he goes from here, here, that's a left foot, right foot, left, and then all of a sudden he turns real hard right here. It, it really tells quite a story, and it's really important to capture it now before it's, before it's gone. What Mike means is the moment the tracks are unearthed, they'll slowly erode away. Now we can preserve a digital file so they will be able to do a tour of this track site on their computers. But any amount of modern day effort pales compared to what happened at this same site back in 1939. Roland T. Bird was a paleontologist who hit the mother lobe here along the Paluxy River, discovering hundreds of theropod tracks along with the first known evidence of sauropods. But Bird didn't just scientifically document the tracks, he dug up a huge section and hauled it off to museums across the country. Almost overnight, the city of Glenrose became famous throughout the world. The following morning, did you see this one we just found? Mike made an incredible find. This, one, this is probably the deepest theropod track that's come out of the park. We've uncovered a track here that hasn't seen the light of day for 112 million years. I mean, give or take a few million. It's pristine, that's very deep. Well, this thing goes on forever. I think it's probably time to put some water in here, soften it up. Thank you. Oh, I thought this was to drink. <laughs> you can, but I wouldn't. <laughs> I was going, it's lemonade. All right, thank you. For the next day and a half, Mike will work to get every last bit of clay separated from this fossilized theropod track. You may want to back up for this. I'm going to blast that track out. What blows my mind is seeing those individual toes. It just gives you so much more depth of information. If you can email a file or you can post it on a website for everyone to look at, you know, so many opportunities for sharing that information, especially if you're working with colleagues studying dinosaur trackways in other parts of the world. Having all this new technology has really opened some new doors. The remnants of real life dinosaurs may not be visually stimulating like the ones created by special effects artists, but the ones here at Dinosaur Valley State Park have a huge advantage going for them. They were real. Well, if the payoff is not worth the effort, I'm one of the biggest idiots on the planet. So yeah, I think the payoff is worth the effort. As long as those tracks are mapped, imagine how many more trails that'll lead us down and the stories they're gonna tell us. Most people that go fishing, you know, it's more about who you fish with than what you're actually doing. It's certainly not the only way to get you know, families and friends outdoors doing something, but it is a great way and it's pretty inexpensive.
We're stocking rainbow trout today uh, here at Mueller Park. We put the tube on the back of the trailer and they just go down the tube into the lake. A lot of times we do stock these parks or for kid fish type events, so they work well. The trout work well for that, for the kids to catch uh, in these smaller impoundments like this. We just love people getting a chance to come out, introduce them to the park, see what kind of activities and things that are out here. So this event we call Hooked on Miller, and we basically work with Texas Parks and Wildlife to stock our lake park with rainbow trout. So the bass, catfish, other fish that are in there, we ask catch and release. The rainbow trout catch take home during the event. A lot of people see something like hunting and fishing and these sort of outdoor sports. You look at all the equipment and you're like, ah, this is overwhelming. I don't, I don't really know even where to begin with this. Most people need to start off at a pretty basic level, gain confidence and familiarity and comfort with the sport up front. So we have this big traveling exhibit trailer about all, all things fishing. Uh, let's see if we're going to get this all the way open with this tree. You know, each panel has information about fishing, uh, what type of species you can fish for, how to be safe in a boat. We can do some educational activities, teach people how to assemble their equipment, teach people how to identify certain fish. We expect the people who attend Hooked on Miller to be be beginners that just need a little help to get started. There's dinner. We get a lot of questions from people at events like that about what to do with their catch. They could go over to the farmer's market and see what to do with it. Thanks to Parks and Wildlife, Rainbow Trout is the dish of the day. So hydration is no, no milk, no water. The demo is really helpful to people who can catch it and don't know what to do with it. If you have a little bit of pepper, a little bit of flour, a little bit of butter, and know how to make a roux, you pretty much can make some Creole. If it's clear at all, then it's not done. You can have really good, fresh, wholesome, organic food, and you can do it affordably if you have some skills. Would you like to try some? Those are the things that we want to make sure that people know. Maybe they don't want to really take up fishing as a family sport forever, but they want to attend a fun event like this. Then people realize it's not that hard to find a place, and it's not that hard to get involved with it. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Sport Fish Restoration Program. This is dry storage, isn't it? Or do you have a live, live well? Live it's pretty much dry storage. Too. Can you pull the plug and let it fill the water? The Inland Fisheries Division, what it does is it manages the public fisheries resources across the state of Texas. We like to say that we make fishing better. And do you have a bucket or anything? If I have a bucket, we can pour some water in the bottom. Well, I'm a regional director, and I oversee uh, several district offices throughout the central and western part of the state. I knew by the time I was in high school that I wanted to be a fisheries management biologist. I go to work, and a lot of days I get to go out and spend it on a boat, or I get to spend it out talking to the anglers who are out there enjoying the same things that I grew up enjoying. It's fantastic. I think I got the best job in the world because you still have the flexibility and the freedom to be able to go out and work in the field, which is really the primary reason why I became a fishery biologist to begin with, but I'd also be able to get to work you know, in the bigger picture of things and helping to set the future for Tex Parks and Wildlife for Inland Fisheries. Zebra mussels were first discovered, you know, in the late 2000s. Brian drew immediate attention to that potential issue and how that could become a problem for Texas. When they showed up here in Texas, it became evident very quickly that it was going to become a statewide issue and it was going to impact people far beyond just Texas Parks and Wildlife. They'll just keep colonizing on top of each other and for like pipelines, for like municipalities, they'll essentially get to the point where they restrict that flow of water in those pipelines so much where they can no longer pump. They can alter the aquatic food chain and they alter the food structure. And in doing so, then they also then can have a negative impact to our sport fish populations within the state as well. Oh, One of the first things we want to make sure when we're leaving a lake um, that's got zebra mussels in it is that make sure you drain all the water because the larvae are microscopic. You really can't see them at all. And we've got to make sure that we drain the water to ensure that we're not moving the larvae to other lakes within the state of Texas. 
Brian is our science lead in zebra mussels. He's been able to rally lots of people around this problem with really no agency dedicated budget. The sediment sample really gets covered up good with the detritus and the algae. Um, they tend to uh, uh, not settle out as quickly on it. Partnership means being able to do more with less. You have to be very creative. When you don't have any designated funding for these uh, eradication efforts or even for the public awareness campaign efforts, you've got to work with other entities and people. If nothing else, I hope that I can make sure that in future generations, they still have these places to go hunting and go fishing. Partnerships are so vital to the things that we do within Tex Parks and Wildlife. I hope that what I'm doing here with the zebra mussel efforts is just one example that people will be able to look at and say, hey, you know what? Partnerships are the way to go. That's great. Doing something that can benefit all people of Texas, that's what we need to be doing more of. It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. Mark Thurman is one of more than 30 producers, photographers, writers, and editors who have contributed to the show since its first broadcast in 1985. My name is Mark Thurman. I spent 21 years at Parks and Wildlife working with the TV show, and my favorite story is a series of outdoor infos that I did with David Alloway. But I would say we have this one. I don't know if we, we did several different subjects, knife nice sharpening, that sort of thing. And it just gave me a chance to spend some time out in the Big Bend country with a guy who knew most everything about that place. One of the most effective ways that you can attract attention in an emergency is through a signal mirror. This one was specifically designed for the job, but you can use, say, the rear view mirror out of a vehicle, or you can buy a computer in about seven to 10 days you'll receive all these really neat free ones in the mail. To utilize any of the mirrors, find the reflection spot on the ground and hold your hand out. Spread two of your fingers and moving the mirror and your hand together, use your fingers to frame your target. It's important to move the mirror up and down to create a flash. Otherwise a pilot or other search and rescue personnel may mistake the reflection for a pool of water or the windshield of a vehicle. You hold the knife, on the stone at the same angle as the bevel of the blade and using your free hand, draw it across the top of the stone as if you're trying to shave the top off. Repeat on the other side. You can do several strokes on one side as long as you repeat the process with the same number of strokes on the opposite side of the blade. One of the ways that you can monitor your water intake is by your urine output. You should be able to urinate twice a day. Also remember, it's the water in your belly that does you good, not the water in your canteen. They found people dead of dehydration with a quarter of a canteen of water still on them. So if you're thirsty, take a good drink. This little vial of potassium permanganate will purify 300 gallons of water. It's also useful in fire starting and some medical preparations. And there's also a small folding knife in here for more delicate cutting chores. I know these work because I carried a kit just like this in Western Australia, covered 120 miles living off the land and out of this box. It's inexpensive, it could save your life, and because it fits in your shirt pocket, there's no reason not to carry one. Okay, going back up to your starting spot there, Dave. And remember, take a couple of steps, or a step, and then start on your second one. And tape's rolling here. Dave, when you're ready. Uh, I think we have five we need to do before we leave this site. So. Uh, <laughs> do I go from here? And you're watching time, Don? Uh, I, I will be. Yeah, that was close. I mean, yeah. yeah it's I close, think, but it's still, yeah. Yeah, it's choppy, but I'm, I'm kind of getting the drift here. I prefer long sleeves and long pants. A breathable. <laughs> e -bidee -bidee -bidee, that's all folks <laughs> I'm still rolling when you're ready Dave
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.